I always enjoy knowing the uh, the backstory on our hymns, and a lot of them have really interesting hymns, and I'm, you know there are whole books out on that. But I came across one uh, that I hadn't heard before this week, and uh, Linda, if you'll advance one slide, please. You of course know um, Fanny Crosby; she's very very well known, and uh, blind lady and she's written hundreds perhaps thousands of songs and we have a, a large number of them in our uh, hymn books we've sung them all of our lives the lady there with her is Phoebe Knapp and Phoebe uh, was a friend of Fanny's and uh, a writer of songs a writer of music and in 1873, she paid a visit to Fanny's home and said, I've got this melody that I have written, and I have tried and tried, and I haven't been able to put words to it. And I've had some other people listen to it, and they haven't succeeded either, so... Would you be willing to listen and see what you can come up with? And she said, well, of course. And so, thank you, uh, Derek. Yeah, that looks a whole lot better. Um, and so Phoebe sat down at the piano and began to play the melody that she had written, composed. And she looked over and Fanny was on her knees looked like she was in prayer. And Phoebe didn't know if she was paying any attention to her or not, but she just continued playing. And in no more than five minutes, Fanny stood up and said, okay, I've got it. And she dictated to Phoebe the words of the song. Now, in our book, we have three verses there may have been more when she, I don't know how many she wrote. But, you know, Church of Christ, you have three verses. So um, it takes a little bit more than three minutes to sing the three verses with the chorus. So she had two minutes to spare to write the words uh, to this beautiful song. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. So it seems to me that one of two things happened. Either Fanny was just this phenomenal prodigy genius who could do something like that, or else the Holy Spirit just gave it to her. Or maybe a combination of the two. One other little serendipity, and then we'll uh, hop into our, our lesson. And back in 2008, Apple came up with the App Store. I'm assuming that Android was about that same time, I guess. I don't know. Not an Android guy. But they started out with uh, 200 apps. And uh, what do they have now? Several 
100,000, I guess. I don't know if you can even count them anymore. Anyway, this was one of them. The, uh, the YouVersion Bible app. How many of you have that on your phone? It's a neat little tool. It's, it's a, I don't know anything about the translation itself, but you can get other translations on that app also. But they've got a, a prayer starter for a daily prayer. They've got all kinds of things on there that are really, really neat. The last I heard, the population of the United States was something north of 330 million people. I'm sure it's more than that now, but 330 million. That's quite a few people. That's men, women, and children. This just went over the 500 million mark in downloads worldwide. Now, with over 7 billion people, that's still not everybody. But... I'm wondering how long it will take them to get to the first billion. I expect not too terribly long. I don't guess there's ever been a time in the history of the world that more people have had more ready access to the Word of God than they do today. Because these smartphones can pick this up out in the middle of the Sahara Desert in Africa through satellite. It's amazing. All right. Um, you left that other one too soon because that second verse for a blind person, visions of rapture. Would you go to the mic? We're on the internet. Okay. <laughs> well, I was just getting tears in my eyes for the second verse because that blind person, visions of rapture now burst on my side. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm thinking, you know, not only Holy Spirit, but I mean, almost seen and being down, you know, on her knees. She, I think she saw. I agree, and and I, I, sometimes our our physical vision gets in the way of our spiritual vision. And she just so many of her songs are about heaven, and so many of them have that same connotation of, of visualizing and viewing and comprehending that us sighted people don't seem to be as capable of doing. Just a few comments uh, that we overlooked last week, uh, not to rehash, but try, to try just to, I had a couple of songs that, uh, that I wanted to include, and so I want to get back to those, and, and then we'll jump on into the second chapter pretty quickly. Um, Peter knows that this is his final message. He tells us that. <laughs> He said that, that I'm, I'm not long for this world. Paul had that same understanding when he wrote 2 Timothy. He knew that, that these were it. These were final words. Preachers like to ask sometimes, and you probably have heard sermons where they say, what would I preach if I knew I had one sermon left to preach? Well, what would you say or what would you write and to whom would you say or write it if you knew that this was your final communication. That's a pretty heavy thought. And I'm sure that we would all have a different approach to it and it would be dictated by the things that were contemporary and current in our life. But it's worth thinking about what really are those one or two core beliefs qualities that we would want to pass on if we had the opportunity to know that this was it. Dying words carry great weight. In the second and third verse, may God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God. The NIV says, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. I mentioned last week that one of Keith Lancaster's favorite things to do is to see he didn't have the gift. He doesn't have the gift of Fanny Crosby. He can't sit down and write three verses of beautiful, beautiful prose in, in five minutes. So he cheats. He pulls it out of the Bible and just puts music to the text of the Bible. This is a song that I was referring to. His divine power has 
has given us on but it repeats the same words he goes through it about three times verses 5 and 7 for this very reason make every effort to add to your faith goodness to goodness knowledge to knowledge self-control self-control perseverance perseverance godliness and godliness mutual affection to mutual affection love for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ we talked about this at some length last week as far as how it relates to the list that Paul left for us in Colossians and in Galatians. One thing that I didn't bring out, because I didn't remember it last week, but uh, an interesting point is that this same list is actually contained in the first letter that Peter wrote. They're just not in a list form. All of them are part of that first book of Peter. The virtue in, in uh, 113, knowledge in 315, self-control in 114, patience in 16, godliness in 115, and love of the brethren in 122, and then agape love in 1 Peter 4 and 8. I thought that was kind of an interesting point of uh, understanding that uh, in the second letter that he's writing now, which is his final word, he comes back to these same points, but he does it in bullets, where he expanded on it a little bit more in his first letter. As we said, Paul makes this list in Colossians 3.12 and Galatians 5.22. Um, how do we remember those? If you're like me, if you want to recite them in order, you sing the song. I told you I had a song for it, not quite as uh, am, uh, rebunctious, am, as, rambunctious as Parker's, but, <laughs> but cute. The words are a little bit different the way we sing it. We say, uh, uh, if you have a banana, you might as well eat it because the uh, banana is not the fruit of the Spirit. This one uses a little bit different words. I like this kind of uh, graphic here because I kind of think of the fruit of the Spirit is being a ripening process, a growing, multiplying, ripening. There's only one fruit, but it kind of grows together and ripens together. Here's a the little song. The fruit of the Spirit's not a coconut. The fruit of the Spirit's not a coconut. If you want to be a coconut, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the Spirit, because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit's not a banana. The fruit of the Spirit's not a banana. If you want to be a banana, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the Spirit, because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit's not a watermelon. The fruit of the Spirit's not a watermelon. If you want to be a watermelon, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the Spirit, because the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And the song goes on ad infinitum. <laughs> as many fruits as there are, you can continue the song. And I have been in youth gatherings, especially for the younger children, where it lasts a long 
long time. For we were not making up clever stories or clever devised fables, myths, that is, when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. Another translation says, we were eyewitnesses when he received honor and glory from God the Father. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. With him I am well pleased. You remember the occasion of that last statement? It happened twice. The baptism is not what I have in mind here because Peter was not at the baptism. Peter said, I beheld his splendor, his majestic splendor, and I heard the voice say, this is my beloved son. What was that? Mount of Transfiguration. Matthew 17, Mark 9. This is my beloved son. Probably this is what Peter is talking about. One of the sons of thunder, James, was likely at the baptism of Jesus. He was a disciple of John the Baptist. But Peter hadn't made that transition yet. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the Holy Mount, the Mount of Transfiguration. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. We must pay close attention to what they wrote, for their words are like a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and Christ, the morning star, shines in your hearts. It's interesting that Jesus is referred to as the morning star by Peter. There are two references to the morning star as far as relationship to a being. And Isaiah 14, 12 says, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. Referring, we believe, to whom? Who was Isaiah talking about? Who do we think? Lucifer, Lucifer. And then Revelation twenty two sixteen, 16, Jesus says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the sacred communities. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. Isn't it interesting that Satan would be, if we're understanding Isaiah right, Satan has been labeled as the morning star who fell the morning star whose light dimmed and is going out. And Jesus is the morning star whose light continues to burn brighter and brighter until the time when it becomes all in all. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or for the prophet's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man for those prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke from God. You've heard that quoted a few times, haven't you? All scripture is God breathed. And the way we have sometimes interpreted that is that the Holy Spirit took a hold of the hand of whoever was writing and he wrote it for him. And therefore every word becomes law and binding. We have that same idea presented by Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God breathed, useful for instruction, for conviction, for correction, for training in righteousness. And in Acts 1.16, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide for those who arrested Jesus. This is Peter speaking. But in this way, God has fulfilled what was foretold through all the prophets saying that this Christ would suffer. Holy Spirit guiding 
the writing and inspiration of Scripture. Jesus promised Peter and all the apostles that the Holy Spirit would also speak through them. And in, isn't it interesting that in Matthew 10 and 20 he says, For it is not you who will be speaking, it will be the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. We have a, a saying when I grew up, maybe you've heard it, it's kind of a slogan or a mission statement, vision statement, whatever you want to call it. We speak where the Bible speaks. We're silent where the Bible is silent. We call Bible things by Bible names, and we do Bible things in Bible ways. You ever heard that? Well, that sounds good, and I don't, you know, I don't take issue with it except in the application of it because we speak where the Bible speaks when we like it, and we're silent where the Bible's silent if we don't agree with something. And we do Bible things in Bible ways if it suits us. We talked a little bit about making the Bible an object of worship. And without, without getting back up on my soapbox or anything, um, that can lead us down a wrong path. I have a high regard for Scripture. But we are not converted to the Bible or to a plan or to a law. We're converted to a person. And the word that we are committed to is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of God. Any rebuttal? All right. Chapter 2. We'll begin with the reading. Second Peter 2. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed, and in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul, over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. 
They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world, through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. I don't know why Peter thought he had to be so politically correct. He could have just gone ahead and said what he thought. <laughs> Make no mistake, he's talking about false teachers. That's the whole subject of this second chapter. There are false teachers in Israel, just as or there were false teachers in Israel. This is looking back historically, the time of Moses and the time of the prophets. Just as there will be, some versions I think say are, false teachers among you, they will cleverly teach destructive heresies and even deny the master who bought them. In this way, they will bring sudden destruction on themselves. Now, I grew up being warned diligently about false teachers and false doctrines, which meant anything that wasn't Church of Christ. Um, we felt a strong compulsion to try to convert every Baptist we met. That's not what Peter is talking about. Peter's idea of false teachers is indicated clearly here in this first verse. These are people who call themselves Christians but deny the person of Jesus, deny his divinity, deny his relationship with God. And obviously they are not on Peter's invite list. He won't be inviting them home for supper. He doesn't like them feel very, very strongly about them. Many will follow their evil teaching and shameful immorality, and because of these teachers, the way of truth will be slandered. In their greed, they will make up clever lies to get hold of your money, but God condemned them long ago, and their destruction will not be delayed. He impugns their motives. He impugns their character. There is nothing about them that is a redeeming factor in Peter's estimation. He's not the only one, of course. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 15, Sermon on the Mount, beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. And I think as we think about who Peter has in his mind and the kind of people that he has in his mind in his culture, in his time here in the 
first century and the beginning of Christianity, uh, the ones that would really stand out would be those who were a part of the Gnostic movement. And we talked about the Gnostics a number of times. They were Christians, even though there were Gnostics before there was Christianity, they, they embedded themselves in the Christian movement and they took on many different manifestations. Um, Marcionism, Hermetism, uh, Carpocratians, Borborites, Manichaeisms, all of these were various shades and flavors of the error, the false teaching, the false doctrine of the Gnostic movement. They denied the divinity of Jesus. Uh, they denied the bodily resurrection. Uh, they had a distorted view of the person of Christ. And uh, they were a threat, a serious threat to the Christian movement in the first and second century. They still exist. Uh, the Gnostics are still a religious movement today in various parts of the world, uh, in our country even. But they're a very um, ineffective and a very small group as far as I know. Uh, some other uh, religious movements um, that are could be classified under what Peter is calling false teaching, false doctrine. Um, the movement of Islam, of course, recognizes Jesus just like we do, but not like we do. They see him as a prophet and a good man, which is an oxymoron because you can't be a good man and lie the way Jesus would have been lying if what he said were not true. Um, the Kabbalah, many different variations and forms of Gnosticism. All of them are challenges to the person of Jesus, denying in different and various ways his uh, divinity. And this is the, the, the crux of what Peter is addressing in this chapter. One other group, and, and I probably shouldn't even mention this one, but I, I'm just bringing them up as an illustration of, of what I'm trying to present. I think, and I can be very wrong about this, and if I'm wrong, I apologize. I think that Jehovah's Witness teaches that Jesus is a created being. I think they deny the physical resurrection and the Trinity. Um, if that's true, I think this would be an example of a false doctrine, a false teaching. Do you, do you see what I'm trying to illustrate? How that this is a, a denial of the personhood of Jesus. Any misappropriation of the core teachings of Jesus is false teaching. The Nicene Creed uh, as justification to persecute dissenters. Uh, you remember with Constantine, he, he wanted to unify his kingdom. And so he had a group of his religious leaders come together and create this Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed within itself is, is a good document, I think. But the motive for it was very wrong. He wasn't interested in, in uh, honoring Jesus. He was interested in getting rid of the dissension in his kingdom and creating a unified kingdom that would be more powerful as a force of power and might and conquest. Crusaders using scripture to justify the killing of Muslims and Jews and disagreeing Christians would be a classic example of false doctrine. The Inquisition using the Bible to punish and kill violators, Christian violators. Uh, the Reformation movement using interpretation of Scripture, speaking where the Bible speaks in their interpretation, and then turning that as a way of punishing and killing anybody who disagreed with them. And they killed them by the hundreds. 
These Christians killing Christians. Christians killing Anabaptists, for example. Somebody who was sprinkled as a child and decided that that was not baptism. That was not immersion for response of faith. And so they were baptized again as adults. And they were killed for it by Christians who challenged them because they had questioned the efficacy of infant sprinkling. Disfellowshipping over forms of worship. We would never do that. These are the things that come to mind and, and the sort of things I believe that Peter would agree is what he had in mind as he so strongly and so viciously dis- described and, and condemned people who were teaching false doctrine. For God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell. The word actually in Greek is Tartarus. It's the only time it's used, I think, in in the New Testament. Tartarus is a transliteration of the, the Greek word. In gloomy pits of darkness where they are being held until the day of judgment. If God didn't spare these, what's he going to do to the false teachers? To these people who are, are bringing shame and discord on the body of Christ because of their false teaching. Jude is going to talk about this too in the sixth verse. And the angels who did not stay within their own domain but abandoned their proper dwelling, these, are, these he has kept in eternal chains under darkness bound for judgment on that great day. Apparently, the the Greek word tartarus, according to some anyway, means to incinerate in eternal punishment. I don't know if that's a literal translation or if that's an application of the word. Kind of hard to tell. Only place it's used. Probably roughly equivalent to Gehenna. Of course, Gehenna, you know, in Matthew 5 and 22 is a reference to the place there in the Valley of Hinnon where they burned their trash. The, the city of Jerusalem burned its trash and it burned day and night. And that was kind of the metaphor that Jesus used to describe those who would be um, convicted and expelled into eternal punishment. The idea of the fallen angels, um, not sure exactly what Peter has in mind there. There, there is a great deal about that in the apocryphal book, the book of Enoch. I think maybe some of you all have read some of Enoch. Maybe I think you mentioned that to me. Peter would probably have been familiar with that. Jude's readers would have been familiar with that. I'm not sure if that's what he's referring to or not. And God did not spare the ancient world except for Noah and the seven others in his family, referring back to the Genesis account. Noah warned warned the world of God's righteous judgment. Um, Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. He preached or proclaimed or heralded or gave the message of righteousness. Different translations saying the same thing. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world and ungodly people with a vast flood. If you remember back in the first book of Peter, Peter associated the flood, Noah's Noah's time, with Jesus' activity while he was in the grave. We wrestled with that a little bit and decided we didn't understand it and couldn't explain it. Here he's using the same metaphor, the same reference, the reference to Noah's ark, to to Noah, the preaching of Noah, uh, and associating it with the uh, fallen angels. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned or overthrew them with heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what will happen 
to ungodly people. You people who are out here teaching false doctrine, you people who are disturbing the, the body of Christ, do you remember Sodom and Gomorrah? That's what you have to look forward to. Pretty graphic. But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick or vexed or oppressed of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented or in anguish or distress or worn down, different translations, in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day after day. So Peter's pretty uh, uh, complimentary uh, of Lot. Uh, We might kind of say, well, he chose to be there. (laughs) You know, he was given the choice. Do you want to go here or do you want to go somewhere else? And he chose that because it looked like a good place to him. But Peter's making making, uh, excuses for him and and complimenting him as being a man who was... uh, who was deeply vexed and grieved by what was going on. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of judgment. And Jesus in Matthew 6, and lead us not into temptation. And I hate that translation. I'm not saying it's wrong. I just don't like it. I I like the... uh, the, the New Living, it says, don't let us yield to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. I don't think God tempts us. I don't think God leads us into temptation. I, I, I can't argue with the Greek, but it just doesn't fit in with my picture of God. I think it much more likely Jesus would have us pray, don't let us yield to temptation. Be a source of strength for us when we are tempted deliver us from evil or from the evil one. And then Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide an escape so that you can stand up under it. Do you believe that? Have you ever been tempted beyond what you could bear? Sometimes it seems like it, doesn't it? But this is our promise. And we can stand on the, on the promises of God. Well, our time is up. I believe we're going to stop there. We'll begin with the 10th verse next week. And we'll kind of end on a, it's either a high or a low place. I don't know what you want to call it. It's, 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 it's a low place if you think about being severely tempted. It's a high place if you think about even in that most of your temptation God is on our side, and if God is for us, who can be against us? So on that note, thank you for your attention and your presence, and have a wonderful God-blessed week.